Ahmed, yeah. should I make an any announcement now? Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to the webinar on the Investment Playbook 2024. Uh, we want to thank you all for taking off uh, your busy schedule uh, and join this informative uh, webinar. Before uh, before we start off this webinar, I wanted to actually introduce uh, the two speakers. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Rakesh Parikh and uh, Mr. Vinay Jaising on the webinar. Uh, just to give you a brief intro on Rakesh. Rakesh has uh, more than three decades of capital market experience uh, with close to two decades uh, spent in uh, JM Financial PMS itself. Uh, in fact, he was instrumental in uh, starting the PMS desk uh, um, uh, close to 19 years back. Uh, before JM, Rakesh had the privilege of working with uh, the investment guru, Mr. Mark Mobius of Templeton. And uh, he was also the co-fund manager of uh, their flagship fund called as uh, Templeton Growth India Fund. Uh, I also have uh, Mr. Vinay Jaising. Uh, he has more than uh, 25 years of capital market experience and uh, he joined uh, JM three years back uh, and uh, he is uh, co-heading the PMS with uh, Mr. Rakesh Parikh. Uh, before JM, uh, Vinay was uh, working with ENAM for close to four years where he was uh, heading the research and uh, he was also managing their flagship portfolio called as the ENAM idea. And he was also an advisor to a few mandates, uh, uh, one being a domestic uh, fund, which is the Optimus, and an offshore fund, which is a pension fund that he was uh, advising on. And before uh, I, uh, before Enam, uh, when I was uh, working with Morgan Stanley for close to two decades, where uh, more than a decade he was the MD and CEO for the firm. And uh, he's also a, a globally ranked oil and gas uh, specialist. Uh, today, uh, what we thought was that we wanted to actually do a very different uh, mode of uh, doing this webinar, wherein uh, both Rakesh and Vinay are going to actually have a more like a question and answer mode, where they will have an interactive session where they uh, Rakesh will ask a few questions, Vinay may answer, Vinay may ask questions, Rakesh may answer. So it's going to be a very interactive uh, conference that we will have. On the investment playbook uh, 2024, uh, they're going to talk about what is uh, likely to be the scenario in 2024. What are the kind of themes that can be played out and uh, everything that you would want to know about uh, the global markets and the and the Indian markets. Uh, my request to all of you is uh, keep yourself on mute and if you have any questions, please put it on the chat board. Uh, we will uh, I'll read out those questions as and when it comes either uh, during the course of the webinar or at the end of the webinar. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, hand it over to Rakesh uh, to take it forward. Uh, Rakesh, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ayapan. Thank you for your kind words. And, uh, you know, thank you, everybody. 
uh, welcome. Uh, you know, we welcome the opportunity to interact with all of you today. Hope everyone is in good health. Uh, both Vinay and I are looking forward to an engaging, uh, you know, enriching engagement uh, with everyone on the call. So, you know, we would really like to take this opportunity to basically review the outlook uh, for Indian markets as we go into 2024. You know, we believe this coming year is going to be an extremely exciting year for markets. And importantly, we want to, you know, give you a good background, uh, you know, of our view from a global macro perspective, as well as a, to provide you a roadmap and outlook for the domestic economy and corporates as we progressively go into 2024. And where are we, uh, you know, especially with the up and coming May elections, uh, which we believe are going to be a major event uh, for this year as we head into 2024. So our whole objective and the conclusions we want to draw, you know, uh, is basically to try and provide some kind of long term strategy uh, for what is our portfolio perspective and uh, to give you a view on our thoughts on how we should position for the same as we head into 2024. So please feel free to ask us questions uh, over the course uh, of the chat uh, and I'll start the ball rolling. Uh, so Vinay, uh, you know, it's very interesting that at the start of 2023, the consensus view was for a very challenging global market, uh, you know, which was characterized or expected to be characterized by higher interest rates for longer, as well as a sharp slowdown in the US economy. However, this does not seem to have appeared to have played out as expected if we observe the strength of the US equity markets during 2023. So have we gone wrong in our initial assumptions, Vinay? Uh, thanks a lot, Rakesh. I think what I'm sharing in the presentation is not being able to be seen in the screen. Uh, uh, can you confirm, Rakesh, that people can see it in the screen? Uh, I don't know if you put it on, Vinay. I can just see you by camera. Let me just try once more because it may just sure. help the team. Sure. Yeah, is you it, can see it, Vinay. Yes. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. So, so thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, apologies for this uh, small nightmare. Uh, but you know, it's a very interesting question, Rakesh. If we were sitting here last year, same time, and looking at you know what went right and what went wrong, uh, we would have said first the world is coming to an end. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a recession coming around the corner. Interest rates in 2022 uh, have risen by as much as four uh, percent, as you can see. And, uh, you know, the big fear was having the interest rates which have risen now going to lead to a slowdown in US. Will the GDP fall in US? And exact opposite view was there for China. China is now starting up post elections, post uh, COVID coming in. And the Chinese government had printed as much as two to three trillion dollars. And that's exactly what happened actually in the first quarter of this year. Our thesis went right of US slowing down and our thesis went right of China uh, increasing its overall production. But uh, thereafter, I'll tell you in a bit what happened. Interestingly, the only thesis which went right for us last year uh, was the CPI inflation data, which all came down. You know, it's just been coming down and down. GDP for the first time uh, in my career of 30 years, I've seen the GDP of US and China and Japan be at the same number for a couple of quarters. You know, 4.5 to 5% was the GDP of US and Japan, which is in my eyes unheard of, right? So the GDP surprised us substantially. Uh, having said that, if I look at, uh, you know, the next stage of what happened in overall results of companies or uh, how the markets fared, uh, the quarter one, as I was telling you, uh, you had China, which was going up, uh, you had, Nasdaq, which up went up 17%. But interestingly, from April to date, Nasdaq kept on singing and China gave up all its losses. And today China stands on a one year perspective being down seven to eight percent. Nasdaq is up 30% in the last year. Actually, CYTD Nasdaq is up as much as 40%. And uh, you know, the entire story has changed and the world has got, had gone on to a risk on trade. India obviously did very, very, very well, especially in the large and mid cap bases, which were, I would say in the last year, the best performing spaces to be in. So last year we had a lot to learn. If I were to turn forward your question, Rakesh, and just say, you know, what we went, we believe is going to happen in the next year. 
I think the interest rates uh, for the first quarter would be tepid. Uh, nothing would happen. Uh, you know, US has announced a pivot already, but you know, interest rates falling would come in the second quarter of the year. Uh, thereafter, you'll see interest rates literally move down. Whether as they did it US and you know during the Gulf time, uh, 2008, uh, whether they reduce the interest rates one shot of 100 basis points, so they would do it you know over three to four quarters would be to be seen. But I won't be surprised if they cut interest rates in one shot. Inflation levels as uh, last year would be coming down, which is good. But my biggest concern, Rakesh, would be on profitability of the world. Uh, you know, when inflation levels come down, uh, you have close to 40 countries having elections next year. Uh, mm. Fiscal deficit is is moving up. Uh, uh, debt is ballooning, uh, uh, you know, uh, bloating up a lot as well. Uh, liquidity of the world is coming down. Uh, so I think the next three quarters uh, may be telling time for most of the parts of the world. U.S. clearly uh, are showing signs of cost of capital going down already and smiling but you know incrementally you'll see a slowdown in us is is our best uh, analysis today but in this background india will clearly be shining courtesy its growth and the two themes i think we as a team largely believe would be capex and make it india but look a lot more in india than look at the external world and the biggest risk we look at is the geopolitical risk uh, followed by elections. Uh, elections is lesser a risk in my eyes than geopolitical risk. Okay, thank you for that, Vinay. So then it's interesting uh, to note one thing. You know, we've just had uh, Fed meet few days back. Uh, you know, where things, uh, uh, the outlook seemed to be that you know a gradual rate cut uh, is in the offing uh, as we head into 2024. Uh, markets have rallied very strongly both globally and in uh, India uh, over the last two, three days uh, post this. What is your sense that this scenario Vinay, will play out uh, going into 2024, you know, in this uh, rate cut scenario? Uh, secondly, how does this, uh, you know, look or what does this indicate about uh, growth outlook in the US vis-a-vis -vis earlier expectations? Especially now if we, as we have been observing the spread between the US 10 year and two year rates have narrowed over the last 12 months. You know, how do you see that playing out? Sure, thanks Rakesh. Uh, I think, uh, you know, rate cut in US is inevitable. Uh, the reason I say this is uh, if I look at the US debt, let me come to that number first. If I look at the US debt, you know, which is uh, total debt is 3.2 times its GDP. Just if I look at the US debt, which is you know the national debt of 32, 33 trillion, which has the duration of almost six years, there's about 7.5, 7.6 trillion coming up for renewal. And if they have to pay higher interest costs on that, you've got a $200 billion fiscal, uh, which is going to pain them. Uh, saying that, uh, having said that, you're also seeing the overall global debt gone to $30 trillion. So it's very important uh, for the overall global uh, scenario to change not just by looking at uh, what's happening on the inflation front coming up but to focus on real interest rates and i think it's pretty obvious that you know you'll see interest rates cut uh, when will it get cut uh, you know i think second quarter or third quarter uh, and the focus of us will be actually this chart which is you know what is the differential between cpi and the interest rates as long as us is having real interest rates uh, uh, you know, their focus would be only on that. Having said that, Rakesh, just one more comment since you mentioned uh, the two year, 10 year chart differential. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, both are slipping down, but still the difference between the two is a negative 50 basis points. Uh, it's not euphoria time. What okay. I mean to say is it's not euphoria time. Uh, US two year interest rate is at 4.4% today. Uh, it is lesser than the US 10 year interest rate. So whenever you have a negative interest rate cycle, it is telling you in the short term there is pain and in the short term the US economy is being questioned. And that being questioned why US GDP grew was largely because of this chart, was largely because the fiscal deficit by US, you know, for CapEx related or right related businesses was increasing. It's gone to a high 6.2, 6.3% number. Now the incremental fiscal increase which could happen uh, could be largely happening due to uh, interest rates pain coming into the picture. 
which I think is uh, uh, something which the government has to address sooner than later. But you know, to address it to you clearly, we think U.S. interest rates will come down, and we think there will be a you know slowdown in U.S. Uh, economy in the next six months. Okay. Okay. So Vinay, I want to go back to one point, particularly you raised on the global debt. You know, I've noticed uh, it's ballooned from about 170 trillion dollars in 2008. It's now crossing $300 trillion, uh, you know, in terms of the latest uh, data that we are sharing. Uh, so a couple of points I had there. Do you see any serious risks from this situation which can spill over uh, in terms of affecting markets generally as we head into 2024? And, uh, you know, in that context, how is India positioned, you know, in this uh, regard? And uh, would we be able to weather uh, any potential uh, global storms as a result of this, you know, because overall, uh, you know, my next question following this would be, you know, in this backdrop, then what is the outlook for emerging markets uh, in particular heading into 2024 and for India in particular? And uh, how do you expect the INR to behave, you know, uh, uh, in this period as we head into next year, INR uh, US dollar and what are the expectations for foreign flows? going into 2024, especially if India is relatively uh, a better positioned. Sure, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rakesh. Lots of questions, so I'll quickly go to them, uh, you know, one by one. First, uh, you know, yes, the global debt has ballooned and, uh, you know, it is at 307 trillion. The same number was about 175 trillion in 2008. So the number has substantially increased to say the least. And uh, sooner than later, uh, the governments globally have to think of, you know, what to do with this. Just to give you in parlance, if the overall world GDP is, uh, you know, somewhere close to 100 trillion, the global debt to global GDP has gone to a number of 3x. Now, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, when I talk to a banking team, they tell us when the ratio comes to that level, you've got to look at whether the company is viable. So is the country or the world viable is the question. Uh, if this debt has gone for the right reasons, which is building in capex, the answer is yes, it's viable. If it is not, which I think because interest rates being high uh, could be a question mark and it's just going to pay the interest rates, it is not viable. And I think that is why you will see interest rates not just in US, but everywhere else, including India, come down. Now, if I look at, you know, the the model which we had earlier used when we were, you know, a little more younger than what we are about 20, 30 years ago, the CAPM model. Uh, you know, the first formula there is your cost of equity is important. Your cost of debt is important. If your cost of debt is coming down, you're going to start seeing P's move up and you're going to see is the market smiling. So there's a lot to smile once the uh, interest rates go down because you start seeing earnings potential get better, but more importantly, your discounted cash flows will give you better target prices. And, uh, you know, the stock should smile, the market should smile when you see interest rates go down. So that's, you know, that's a positive. Uh, when we look at, uh, you know, you said emerging market, I'll just spend a minute on China. Uh, the problem, you know, uh, before we reach emerging market was you had this big global deflator called China. And if you look at anything in the property market, you see anything in industrial product pricing, you see things in exports, you see their bank loans, you see their real estate business, everything is a cross. So it's very difficult for anyone to analyze when will you start seeing uh, China again become a global deflator, which is where emerging markets in India become better platforms for the world to look at a lot more stability comes in out here. Having said that, the biggest risk of India has always been crude oil. And yeah. the good news for us is today Russia forms 30 to 35 percent of our net oil imports. And that number we are getting at about give or take change uh, 10 to 15 percent discount to the prices what the rest of the world is spending. So if today the price of crude oil is 75 dollars, it is 65 dollars as far as India is concerned for 30 percent of their overall uh, consumption. So that's a big change. It reduces our import bill and gives us a cushion to whatever happens on, uh, you know, the, an oil shock because we obviously net big importers of crude oil. Uh, you know, 75, 80 percent of our net uh, requirement of oil still comes from the rest of the world. Having said that, uh, Forex reserves are close to peak levels at 570, 580 uh, billion dollars. 
And I think that is set to change a, a lot in the years to come for the positive, and I'll take you through the reason why. Uh, but before I do that, uh, uh, what I can also see is that uh, you know what RBI has done is they've maintained the liquidity uh, to be more in a negative zone than a positive zone uh, by increasing you know ratios for risky assets which you want to keep. The capital adequacy ratio is increased. You need to keep more money in CRR, your SLR related issues, which is leading to the banking system being in a little bit of a negative uh, zone. And I think they are doing that because you're seeing capex in the country increase, and that number will soon go to a, a positive number. Uh, before you know, before I address your question on emerging market, I want to tell you why we are biased towards India. Just just for a minute, Rakesh. Uh, yeah. It took us 60 years, you know, to get the first trillion dollars. Now we are talking about seven years going to three years to get the next trillion dollars. We moved to 10 number in GDP or the fragile 10 uh, to moving to, you know, somewhere close to top five, top four, and then finally top three in, in the next couple of uh, years. What is interesting, Rakesh, is we only contribute 1.5% of the MSCI index and profit, but we're incrementally contributing 15% of the world's GDP. If this is the amount of GDP contribution which we are having, you're bound to see investments come into the country. That comes to the big bad question. Uh, you know, I, I'm using the word bad because I, I very strongly believe we as a team, uh, when we came out with the last webinar, said that you know we are excited about seeing the market being at 25,000 levels uh, in the year fiscal 25. And our economist uh, and financial analyst did remind me that please don't forget, you know, uh, first year you're already seeing 20,000 levels breach. Guess what? 21,000 levels breach. So will that be breached in 2024 itself? And I think he's right, right? Why is he right? Because, you know, come the election year and you get a stable government, you're looking at the last five year average PE of 20. Based on that, you're saying as an investor, you're at a premium of 80% to emerging market and 25% of the world. But what you're not saying is that the earnings growth trajectory of the country has gone from 5 to 10% or sub 10% from 2008 to 2020, and mm -hmm. now it's gone to 15% and inching up, and that growth is coming from multiple sources. So I will not be surprised if the number of 20 goes to 22 or 23, uh, just a 10% pickup, and the earnings growth trajectory goes uh, north of 15%. In my bull case, so for me, seeing a target of let's say 25,000 in the next 15 months is not something we cannot dream of. So very excited about the Indian markets, but emerging market is at a 10 year low. Uh, so clearly non Japan, uh, uh, non China, actually, you will start seeing flows come into Asia and you will start seeing a lot more flows come into India. Having said that, just one or two more points on earnings, uh, Rakesh. Yep. Uh, the growth which we are seeing is broad based. If I look at the earnings growth in the second quarter, I take out the financials. Uh, I see a 16% growth and I also take out the energy. I see a 15, 16% growth in the last three years. Kager. If I keep everything, we've grown at 19% uh, for the country, which is a fantastic number as far as we are concerned. And this is 19% CAGR for three years. Uh, for one year, the CAGR is 35%, mm -hmm. right? The rate of growth from last year to now, we are growing beautifully and the growth is coming all over. So my perspective, you know, the spaces you want to focus on are autos, uh, where you start seeing inventory levels being at wafer thin numbers and demand being very strong. Uh, banks, pure banks, you know, you've got to be there because I think that's where the world economy uh, or the domestic economy lo uh, loan book growth is showing you that it is robust. Uh, retail growth is 30% per annum for loan book. It's unbelievable. Every time we believe it's going to correct, it inches up. Uh, the CapEx sector, the profit growth contribution of the CapEx sector is going up from 34 to 228 times. And these are the spaces you want to be in. Uh, IT sector, uh, we would, you know, I think the earnings growth contribution would be as it was historically. But where do you get all that money from? I think all that money you would get from, you know, sectors like the energy sector, Rakesh. Mm. Uh, one last chart I want to share with you uh, before I hand it over again to you is 
look at this growth which I mentioned to you. You know, 97 to 2023, 10% CAGR. Now you're at a 15% CAGR. Are we going back to the 2003 to 2008 days wherein your 15% number goes to 25% CAGR? Uh, the government has done all the right things. Uh, the profit pool as a percentage of GDP has gone from 2 to 5 in the last 5 years. Uh, why can it not go to 10 with such quality IPOs coming in? And more importantly, when the rest of the world is at 10%. So I think there are exciting times for earnings visibility for the country as a whole, Rakesh. So just a couple of points on, on what you've elaborated, Vinay. First, I would say you are we are very clear. You think India's premium to other emerging markets are justified. Uh, but having said that, you know, the way the euphoria seems to be building up, uh, you know, do you believe the Indian markets are discounting a Goldilocks type of scenario? Or, you know, you're, we are very clear that we have comfort that the earnings trajectory now is moving in the right direction where, uh, you know, with this growth we are expecting, uh, the direction is justified. You know, your your 25,000, uh, 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 you know, I think it would be good to, to, to get some clarity on that part. <clears throat> Sure, Rakesh. Uh, I'm going back to this uh, earnings trajectory comment. Uh, uh, so, f so you know, first and foremost, what we need to understand is the earnings and I'm showing you actuals, right? I'm not talking about future. If okay. I'm showing you actual earnings, just look at the QOQ earnings growth for each sector and I'll read it out for the team. Mm. Financials, 20%. Energy 154%, obviously 154% because OMC has had a bumper quarter. They didn't uh, cut prices and uh, last year they had losses. I think the government is allowing them to, uh, you know, get uh, their balance sheet in shape. So that's a good sign. Consumption was the slowest at 12%. Uh, IT because of the slowdown in US was 5%. What am I seeing? 88% for auto, 22% for health. So the numbers were all over 132%. Uh, 52%. Look at the numbers, you know, capital goods 35%, media and entertainment 52%, telecom 22%. So numbers have been crazy and yeah. it's broad and the depth is high. So I'm going back to the comment I made to you. Uh, mm. It's not about just banks now. You know, India at one time had 40 to 45% contribution historically coming in from banks if you would look at indices and everybody would focus only on that. Now we have a lot more depth and breadth in the overall market, Rakesh. OK, OK, interesting. So going ahead now, uh, structurally, what would you say when are the key themes, uh, you know, in key sectors which are going to provide some of the best uh, wealth creation opportunities for the next two to three years? So, you know, our perspective, there are three key themes we like. Uh, I'm going to start with the second and third theme first. Uh, and then move on to the first. You know, the okay. first is the CapEx cycle theme. Mm. Uh, that's something our team is extremely excited about. Uh, the CapEx cycle doesn't need to be just in the capital goods sector. It can also be in the defense sector. It can also be in telecom sector. You know, today I'm sitting in Delhi and doing a call uh, using a network through a mobile uh, app. And, uh, you know, we are talking in teams and we've got, you know, 100 plus clients sitting in, uh, you know, different parts of the country and chatting up with us. A yeah. uh, lot of CapEx is going on with companies like Bharti, though they're going to be FCF positive a lot more sooner than people had expected. Uh, we're excited about the way the government had uh, is spending on the overall CapEx. You know, they've spent they've announced they spent 1.6 trillion in 2014. They're spending 9 trillion rupees in this budget and this will be overachieved. If you add the PSU number, that number goes to 14 billion rupees or about 4.6% of the overall GDP is what we are spending in terms of CapEx. Where is this CapEx going? Water, rail, defense, roads, powers and many other businesses. But look at the growth which it's had in these businesses seven mm. times to 17 times. The average growth the Indian government has spent in terms of CapEx is about 5.6 times. So clearly this is a space where none of us can say that we know that uh, uh, 
the overall numbers or the overall uh, market is discounting the right prices uh, and these stocks after running up by 50 to 100 percent are right. Uh, what you will see is the earnings growth trajectory. Let me just give you an example of a single railway company, you know, which one of my colleagues uh, uh, Rahul covers. He has raised his EPS for F2025 uh, from about 15 last year to 32 to 33 rupees this year. So when we see that the stock has moved from 300 to 1000 plus levels, 100% uh, is the EPS growth as well, which he had not expected earlier. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of P re-rating, but there's also earnings re-rating story which has happened in the CapEx sector. So, you know, that is the single biggest space we would be excited so, about. Okay. Vinay, just to, to halt you there, one minute on the on the CapEx part. Uh, it's CapEx and industrials broadly have been probably the best performing sector or amongst the best performing sector last year. It's also, you know, this uh, area along with the Make in India theme appears to be, you know, probably the most, I would say, popular consensus bull call in the market at this juncture. So where could we go wrong in this space, you know, especially with the kind of outperformance or gains we've already seen so far this year? Uh, it's a very, very, very interesting question, Rakesh. Uh, uh, we can go wrong uh, on two ways. If the technical uh, issues relating to the companies uh, hit us, which is very simply put, all these companies in the shorter term need to depend on other companies for their order. Okay last quarter of Bharat Dynamics, last to last quarter, the results which came out prior to this uh, Q1 and Q2. Uh, what happened to that defense company was it couldn't get its uh, orders executed because it was waiting for uh, its raw material to come from uh, other parts of Asia and it got delayed by a quarter. And analysts cut numbers by, I don't know, 20, 30 percent. And all of a sudden in the next quarter, which was the results which just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, you saw 50, 60 percent growth on a year on year basis. But the mm -hmm. stock got clobbered from 12, 1300 to 8, 900 rupees. By the way, it's back and it's back with a vengeance. It's, it's back even higher. Uh, so technically where we can go wrong is in the supply chain if we are depending a lot more in the rest of the world and that supply chain gets delayed. You can have an issue. That's step one. Where we can go wrong, and I think that's where I think our team does a wonderful job. Uh, I mentioned Rahul, but I should mention Mukund as well. Wherein they look at balance sheet analysis a lot more better than uh, you know what I would have expected. They look at the cash working cycle of these companies. Just imagine a case that you've got an order book, you've got a margin of 10%, but you've got you know 300 plus days of uh, receivables coming in. What's yeah. going to happen to your cash position if your margins are less than 10%? Because you've got interest and tax. That means you're basically making zero as far as the cash conversion cycle is concerned. Now, that is really important that we can go very wrong if we get excited and we mm. don't see the balance sheet of any of these companies. Uh, I'm a little lesser concerned on the government spending lesser on CapEx because I think, you know, whichever government comes, uh, the way the workforce of India is growing, CapEx is the need of the hour. India has to become a capital of uh, manufacturing of the world at 2.5 to 2.7%. Uh, you need a magnifying glass to find us. You know, Yes, we've done well on the uh, mobile part of the story, but we are at, largely struggling to become a world player. You know, uh, We have a lot of contract manufacturing suppliers coming, but manufacturing play is going to do well, and that's all emanating from you know, the same story uh, be it uh, for CapEx or be it for defense. The fourth place where we can go wrong, I think, is uh, where, again, for a short period of time, you start seeing not just the order book slow down, but and or the execution slow down. We don't have people to execute it as much because there are certain sectors wherein you need a lot of quality people to execute it. But these are right. all positive problems. So okay. if you're saying that the order book is, let's say, seven to ten years for these companies, uh, let's take the example of Hindustan Aeronautics. Uh, mm -hmm. If the order book is seven to ten percent, when does the first stages come in, which it mm -hmm. can sell to you know to the end customer? Does it come in in fiscal 2025, first quarter or second quarter? So these would be more small modalities. Uh, obviously, geopolitical risk I'm not discussing uh, because if mm -hmm. that happens, you know. Uh, you will start seeing extreme slowdowns and people get a lot more nervous about the space. But I think the 
the pluses where we can go right is a lot more than where we can go wrong today. And okay. I, I, you know, it's interesting you said that, you know, people are consensusly buying it. Uh, I don't see reports uh, in the sell side for half these companies. So mm. there's a lot more coverage which you will see in these companies, a lot more robust okay. stories will be emanating out from these companies. These companies didn't exist, some of them six months ago. Yes, yes. Right. Absolutely. So it was definitely not consensus last year compared to this year. Uh, so technically, I think uh, uh, you will see two to three years of growth coming. What will be interesting is what happened to the railway companies once they've given the 12,000 plus per month of wagons. Do they start getting export orders and does India become a manufacturing hub? So I'm pretty comfortable in the next three years for these stories. But how do we become a big manufacturing hub for these names in the future would be interesting to see. That's thank you for that. Vinay. Can I shift now to to financials? You know, since that's the big elephant in the room in terms of in our major index is about a 30 percent weight. Uh, you know, and bank balance sheets have improved considerably uh, over the last few years. Credit growth has picked up sharply in the last uh, 12 to 15 months. What is our outlook on this very large and important sector going into 2024? And, and, and how should investors position uh, in this space? So the way we would break up financials is the word financials does not mean banks. It is lending and non lending, right? Yeah. So let's start with that basic first part of it. Sure. On the non lending part of the business, we may not be as bullish as we are on the lending part of the business. Why are we bullish on the lending part of the business? Because the Indian banking sector is extremely robust. Credit growth is super crazy. And the quality of NPAs have largely reduced substantially. And okay. the cap, you know, the capital weighted ratios, the capital adequacy ratios with the companies have are all extremely positive. So if you look at just this chart for the banks, quality of assets is good. Quality of balance sheet is good. We've got enough of capital liquidity. I, uh, you know, I would say based on even the current RBI guidelines, people are doing uh, equity issues very quickly and that would be neutral to a maybe a little bit negative. Government is taking a, a lot of initiative or capex. Uh, but yes, there is a problem globally. So if I keep, you know, so many ticks as compared to just one negative, I think the banking sector is in a sweet spot for loan book growth. But now let's go back to where we started, Rakesh, this presentation that the interest rate cycle is coming down. Right. What happens when interest rate cycles come down? The cost at which you charge an end consumer goes down. When you, the cost at which you charge an end consumer goes down, uh, your loan book growth will be rock solid, but we are not very confident that the NIMS uh, may not be questioned and they may come down a little bit, especially now that HDFC Limited has gotten to HDFC Bank as well. Uh, mm. You know, they have to increase their, uh, uh, you know, uh, their fixed deposits. So the rates are attractive, but you'll start seeing everybody reduce rates as far as what they're charging an end consumer. Uh, and that may lead to, I think, tepid NIMS. Uh, but you will see a loan book growth, which is robust and we are excited uh, the banking space. But in the banking space, you have a problem of plenty. Uh, okay. And that's where really we would use our art of if we like a micro cap company, do we look at a fusion? If you if you want a gold loan company, do we look at a Manapuram? Uh, if you know if you want a bank which is really, uh, you know, increasing its market share, do we look at companies like IDFC? Uh, so there are a lot of very interesting plays, I think, in the overall banking sector. Uh, okay. One last comment. Sorry, this is a tough question. Uh, the weightage of banking and financials together at 31 percent. Is that the right number? You know, globally, that number or even for emerging market, that number is 22 to 23 percent. So okay. we would like to be largely in that kind of a range for sure. India as compared to a 30 percent range. You know, sure. somewhere between 20 to 25, a uh, little closer to 25 than sure. 20. But that's where we would be a lot more comfortable being. OK, Benet. thank you for that. Now, moving on to another interesting area. Outsourcing themes have been quite popular over the last few years. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm sure that, you know, this would also play a part in one of our uh, themes, uh, you know, for the next two to three years. And uh, particularly now where there is uh, much more bigger 
uh, I would say requirement or expectation that India can meet a lot more, uh, uh, you know, global supply chain uh, diversification uh, uh, requirements. Uh, in that context, you still see speciality chemicals and pharma, which was one of the more original outsourcing teams uh, offering longer term growth opportunities, uh, especially recently, you know, these sectors have relatively underperformed, you know, compared to a lot of the domestic themes. But do you see longer term uh, both these areas being still a key outsourcing theme? And more importantly, you know, in this overall outsourcing umbrella, you know, where, where do you see the, the, the strongest uh, areas now, uh, you know, building up here, you know, in terms of growth uh, over the next few years? And more importantly, you know, I would say, do you see any scope for engineering and auto exports, you know, becoming another large uh, uh, outsourcing theme from India? So, you know, Rakesh, uh, if I would slow down uh, this question and break it up into four small parts. Mm. Firstly, is India becoming a manufacturing hub for the world? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, why the answer is yes? Because we never had a lucrative tax structure historically which the Indian government has given you. The tax rate for manufacturing is 15%. So mm -hmm. it's a big positive because that's comparable to the rest of the world. Our manpower was never being questioned. The quality of English literacy was never being questioned. Only one thing was being questioned that will we be profitable? Mm -hmm. To club that up, uh, what the government is also doing in PLIs, they're giving you incentives on revenues which you can produce uh, your manufacturing base as well. So clearly, yes, outsourcing from India will be a big number. But you know, it's interesting you were speaking about specialty chemicals. I would mm. say, why can't we outsource defense? You know, mm. why can't we outsource, uh, you know, a Tejas? Why can't we outsource drones? Why can't we outsource missiles? Right. And there are so many high quality companies in ammunition, in aerospace, in shipyard, uh, you know, okay. where you are seeing outsourcing today, a small number, you know, it's 1% in Hindustan Aeronautics, it's about 8% uh, in Bharat Dynamics, but these numbers will quadruple, you know, in the times to come. Uh, but going to your chemical uh, uh, question as, uh, as the second question, uh, mm. clearly where we see outsourcing as a big space is in three places. Uh, wherever you have green chemistry, whether you have specialty chemistry and wherever you have the CDMO story, okay. uh, we think there is a lot of outsourcing. So simply put, uh, India's 20 year ago story in IT uh, could be coming in from today from the space of specialty chemicals and pharmaceuticals becoming the global capital hub for the world. Uh, you know, CDMO, uh, uh, bromine chain or fluorine chain and specialty chemicals, all of them uh, where you have, you know, probably lesser threat mm. from China also coming up and very sticky clients. Uh, for us, that's a yes, yes. So a sizable chunk of our portfolio also, uh, you know, just to give you some names, uh, also come from the specialty space, right? Sure. So we really like companies, you know, uh, be it arcane in the bromine chain or tatwa, which is an SDH, uh, it's a bromine derivative uh, moving to electrolysis. Uh, uh, I would even put, you know, in a global outsourcing theme, companies like Concor Biotech uh, uh, or even companies like Bluejet, you know, uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, giving you uh, uh, fermentation based medicines and it's the global leader in that, you know, 20% plus market share. Uh, the uh, other is giving you contrast media Inc where it's got a 10% market share. Uh, okay. They're already big contract manufacturers, but guess what, Rakesh? You and I didn't know the names of these companies last year, same time. So yes. all of a sudden we know companies in this space having a 10 and 20% market share. So okay. I think fantastic uh, uh, data telling us that, yes, you know, chemicals is a great space to be in, but I'm using the word chemicals equal to uh, specialty chemicals, fine chemicals, uh, and pharmaceuticals as well. Uh, going to your next space, you know, there's a marriage of, uh, uh, I would say, the IT sector. I'm just quoting Manju, our IT analyst, uh, and she said it so well to me that, you know, it's reverberating now. Uh, there's a marriage of engineering, research, and development, which is going to take over manufacturing. Why okay. can't we develop what we know, uh, use our DNA, use our, uh, you know, R&D, uh, produce something and also become a manufacturer? Look at a company like Scient, you know, which is 
listed off its uh, manufacturing hub in DLM and it's focused into many things which also include airlines and uh, they've started dealing with companies in the automotive industry. Mm. Uh, look at Tata Technology, a recent listing, you know, which is, uh, you know, looking at EVs, uh, looking more in the outer part of the uh, uh, vehicles or the autos. Uh, but more importantly, now it's got into airlines in a big way as well. It's not just a IT company. It's not just a manufacturer. It's doing both and it's doing both in such a way that it's making a niche for itself uh, after research and developing it. And that could be a big story, you know, in the years to come uh, as well. Uh, so I think there are many, many, I mean, uh, ways uh, wherein you'll see the overall, I would say, outsourcing story being played out in the country. Correct, 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 correct. Okay, Vinay. So I think in conclusion, there are there are enough opportunities, uh, themes, uh, you know, which are there, which you've covered, where are going to give very good uh, opportunities for wealth creation, basically, you know, uh, as we move forward. Uh, I think now one other area I, want, I wanted to focus on, Vinay, was more from uh, uh, the flows aspect. You know, uh, I've observed, uh, you know, from an India-specific context, FII ownership, is near a 10 year low at present. Uh, you know, do you believe flows in India would rise significantly in the coming years, especially, you know, with our higher earnings growth uh, potential, stable macros, and obviously an increasing global relevance, uh, you know, for investors? So do you believe or do you wish, you know, Rakesh, mm -hmm. if you say, do you wish, I think 100%, Right. Uh, do I believe it cannot be 100%? But I think if you look at it mathematically, if I look at December data, it's gone even closer to 16%. Right. And if if we if we look at this data and we just look at one simple point, India is incrementally adding 15% of the overall world's GDP. And if there is a stable government coming to the picture, when will this 4%, which is 16, 17% going to 20% uh, catch up happen? 4% hmm. of a $4 trillion market cap country is equal to $160 billion. Having said that, let me dream a little bit more, Rakesh. Uh, right. If in the next three years, we add a trillion dollars of GDP. Okay. And if we stick to the market cap to GDP ratio of one is to one, which is, which is what is the case currently, we're at about 1.2, but let's go to one is to one. There's mm. another trillion dollars of market cap coming up in the next three years, Rakesh. Right. In that trillion dollars of market cap coming up in the next three years, uh, even if you had to keep a 16 or 17 percent share, that number also is 160 billion dollars in the next three years. So come what may, and I'm not even getting into the JP Morgan EM debt fund coming in, I can see the FIIs in a matter of time come into the country a lot more than they did earlier. But let me ask you a question. Why are you talking about global investments or global equity coming into the country? Why should you and I not focus in what is happening on SIP data coming into the country? Absolutely. Today, yeah. the amount of data which is or the amount of domestic inflows coming in the country, we just said even I made the same mistake of saying the word SIP. But yeah. why can we not have our own pension fund like Norway? And that become one of the world's biggest uh, pension funds, or at least the country's biggest pension funds. If I look at the 2023 data, out of $32 billion, about $13 billion came in from pension funds. Mm -hmm. And this number is set to rise. Uh, and this number is not volatile, right? This number is a steady state number. SIP domestic is a steady state number. It's already gone to over $2 billion a month, Rakesh. So I think you have a lot of uh, feel good factor happening on the technical part in the country. And yes, you know, uh, I would hope, uh, you know, come stability, uh, which, uh, you know, seems to be a lot more uh, hopeful or real, uh, you know, the times to come. Uh, mm. FIS who've now gone from an overweight position of 300 basis points in our analysis to virtually being just equal weight India will read look at what they're doing. And yes, you know, we strongly believe inflow should come into the country. Sure. And incidentally, when you had mentioned about, you know, obviously our inclusion in the 
JP Morgan uh, Global Bond uh, Index, uh, and obviously it's going to be a, a positive. Uh, you know, how do you see that uh, playing out in terms of time frame, uh, and how positive will it be for the broader economy uh, in India? So first and foremost, the number which you know is floating in the market is twenty-four billion dollar number. Uh, yeah. How positive will it be? I I don't think the inflows are as important as how positive it would be. Look okay. at every NBFC in the country. If today they need global debt, what rate are they getting it at today, and what will yeah. happen to them uh, a year from today? Yeah. Right, that number would come down for them. So anyone who needs global debt now, all of a sudden. could get it a lot more cheaper than they did earlier we keep on talking about india's 10 year versus the us's 10 year you know when it went to 2% being bad for the currency and at 4% we are you know it's kind of a sigh of relief uh, but what will happen is india's got one classical case and i pardon me i didn't address that answer you'd asked earlier uh, mm. for the rupee uh, mm. getting firmer if so much inflows come into the country what's going to happen to the rupee what's yeah. going to where is this money going to go the last time india saw 100 billion dollars in the year coming into the country the capex of the country swelled and sure. that's that's the era you're getting into you know come next come next to next sure interesting vinay and you know just to close off on this area you know obviously if the the outlook is is extremely positive for india we are expecting obviously flows uh, to grow significantly uh then naturally there uh, will there be a case for india's weightage in the msci at least emerging markets index to rise substantially uh in the next few years so that's already happened uh, uh let me put it this way you know 6 has gone to 10 and i'm mm. talking about uh, you know the msci weightage including japan uh okay. china's 19 has gone to 26 so india has been the biggest beneficiary what has not happened in our view is really this chart the mm. overall weightage of india uh, in an fii's eyes okay. has been the same if they were 16% and now i'm not comparing like to like you know earlier i said 10% including japan so now i'm just talking about em in mm. india you know em weightage is 16% that number was 16% uh, in our analysis which fii has owned in 2019 today with the 3 4% uh, reduction that number is also 16% today it's just that the overweight condition which msci had done is not been followed uh, it, it basically it's their overweight to msci in 2019 has become equal weight so fis have not followed their overweight stance they are seeming to believe that it's over uh, they seem to believe that it was always 16% which was the right number and i think that's where soon they will realize that oh shit you know we've not increased our allocation and msci has caught up way before us you know normally it should happen the other way around and i think you'll see a lot of inflows purely happen because of that okay so when in my my last uh, question now and more for for the sake of you know our participants and hopefully you know i will use this as a platform to open it up to q and a you know but just as a quick summary you know how would you how would we now position our equity portfolios as we move uh which are the broad sectors we should be overweight on are there any sectors we would be less positive on and which sectors may surprise significantly in the coming year so i think we you know some point of time in the year we are 10 to 15% of cash hmm. uh now our cash position has gone wafer thin uh for the obvious reason we think you know we are a lot more excited today uh than ever before so firstly we would be invested in the equity market i think that's the way to start second uh we would be overweight capex in industrial and by a barge pole we would be taking a lot of active uh, risk even in banking sector where we could be close to equal weight purely banking and lending i'm not talking about non lending where we would be underweight uh we would be looking at names where we think there is a high growth you know there could be mfis into it uh, there could be gold loan companies there could be a lot of interesting ideas which are growing a lot more today uh then they did earlier sure uh, uh there could be integrated gold loan company there could be integrated mfis as well you know if we've seen some company has acquired some other company in the mfi space and you know it's now going to grow a lot more faster even that comes into the picture uh it sector where we were underweight 
purely because it's becoming a manufacturing story with the ERD space as well. Uh, sooner than later, we are inching up our underweight position out here. Okay. The sector where I see where we would be underweight is energy. Okay. <clears throat> and the reason why we are saying this is when you're looking at energy, uh, you've got, you know, firstly, companies uh, in the OMC chain. Uh, secondly, mm. you've got companies which are dealing with crude, and third are the refiners. Uh, Technically, if we're talking about EVs per se in the next two to three years, mm. how much of energy are you going to use incrementally in terms of growth in the next three years is a function of how fast EV story picks up. And okay. that would lead to probably volume decline in energy as a space. But yes, you know, you can start seeing as OPEC has shown you time and again, uh, you can start seeing them cut production and prices to move up or geopolitical risk can come up. So that's the space where we would be negative on. Rakesh. So a overweight capex uh, uh, overweight make in India stories uh, B underweight uh, the energy space. Sure. OK, so I think with that uh, Vinay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, you know, for going into such wonderful detail, uh, you know, all the points uh, that we've been discussing and now I'll hand it back to Ayapan. Ayapan, I request you if you can now moderate any questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I yeah, I think uh, one question that has come up, uh, uh, Rakesh and Vinay, is on the flows. Hmm. Uh, the question is uh, is uh, that key, what is that the FIs or the offshore investors are not seeing or seeing that they have actually been under owned and uh, what is the DIs are seeing so much that they are they are more invested in India or more bullish in India. So I think the the conversations that we are hearing is that. India is a fairly an insulated or a decoupled market, but uh, what about the flows? So maybe if you could just uh, throw some highlight, though you covered it, I think maybe in a in a more elaborate way. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Satan. Uh, so I think it's nothing dealing with what FIs are not seeing in the Indian market, but it's a lot more dealing with what FIs are seeing in their own domestic market. Uh, think of it this way, right, Ayapan? Uh, if we were looking at India's interest rate scenario, you know, at 7%, we've not seen a negative uh, uh, contango, any kind of impact between short term and long term. They're both the same rate, more or less, you know, plus minus 5, 10 basis points is really nothing much. Uh, five years ago, we had much higher interest rates. So, you know, we are doing a lot more better. Uh, we didn't have earnings growth trajectory, which has come up in the country uh, off late. So we domestically can understand what's happening. Now, put the other way, uh, none of us as an economy, if you're doing so well, have the relative issue of, you know, when we are buying a real estate business, we're saying, wow, real estate rates have not gone up as much. Ayapan's salary has gone up a lot more and he can, he can afford a much, much better house and, you know, a golden color one as well. Uh, so technically, our consumption pattern as we move from the 2000 per capita GDP to 3000, 4000, 5000, is increasing and that trend of ours is also helping us understand why domestic is more important. On the other side, uh, you know, uh, Russia and crude oil prices clearly has led to issues for the consumers in US or the rest of the world. So if you look at if you were a retail consumer Ayapan, of US and you had taken a mortgage at zero plus two percent three years ago on anything, you know, on, on, on real estate, or you had bought a car at uh, you know a two percent uh, interest rate today because you're multiplying that rate to you know uh, the you know the interest rates of us have moved up at least by five percent your mm. mortgage rate has gone up four times your your rate for the credit card what you were taken has gone up four times you're paying two percent now you're paying seven to eight percent your education bill has gone up so much now keeping mm. that in mind are you going to focus on global markets are you going to focus on what you're doing domestically? Now that's step one. Step two is Nasdaq has seen the Magnificent 7 go up. We are talking about India's large cap, small cap, mid cap go up by 30%, 35%. We're going crazy. Out there you're seeing numbers north of 100% in some names, right? So they've seen uh, what's happening to the Magnificent 7 as well. And then there's the rest of the world, or I would say even the rest of US, you take out the top seven or top 10 names, and you look mm. at the Russell index, it's gone nowhere in the last 12 months. So I think the problem is more emanating in the economic structure and the QT, uh, uh, you know, which the world has seen, uh, the M2, which is at a 20 year low. You know, this is the first time 
we are seeing the overall year in ages actual m2 declined for the world by a you know a couple of trillion dollars you always saw the m2 rate of growth reduce but here we are talking about declining m2 right so that has to be playing out on where you would make your allocations now incrementally when you start seeing the interest rate scenario get lower you start seeing liquidity get better where you would jump on to is basically places where just safer havens where you're seeing much more loose growth and i think that's where india would uh, you know shine also yeah. one more thing somehow i'm sorry it's a long answer uh, apologies but somehow emerging market and india still go hand in hand so if you're seeing emerging market outflows happen because of the pain in emerging market india is getting that 16% of outflow also happen and i think that's where outflows have been a lot now we are talking about outflows just see what happened in the last 10 or 15 days look at the sizable amount of inflows if i have put in in just 2 to 3 weeks yeah. the number is ridiculously high so when they want to rectify it they do that overnight and i think that's what you will see in india if not today uh, immediately post election cool uh vinay and raksha both of you can take uh, either of you can take it uh, there's a question on uh, capex and make in india team uh, uh, vinay i think there was a mention that you are overweight that uh, there's a question on on what are the kind of picks that you are taking but uh, i leave it up to you to if you want to talk on the picks but they want to understand how much are you overweight number 1 uh, and number 2 is uh, will large cap it and mid cap chemical and pharma be contra bets if they are contra bets what kind of uh, numbers or weights would you want to actually put so are you uh, eq weight to the to the benchmark or you are like underweight overweight so you may want to just answer that sure i you know i was dying to show a disclosure level so that a compliance team is happy so i'm going to use that to give you an answer ayapar right uh, and okay. i hope it helps the team uh, yeah. yes we are overweight the capex uh, cycle we are significantly overweight the capex and industrial cycle uh, the overall weightage of capex and industrial in indices is under 8 9% is way under 8 9% uh, we are more than 3 times that number so we are significantly overweight and it's different for different portfolios but we are significantly overweight you know that's step one uh, companies we like at today's price are all the companies you know in this list out here uh, a lot of them as you see are capex related companies uh, be it kirloskar oil be it be it tech wabak be it uh, uh, you know the defense names uh, you know you've got a lot uh, happening out there uh, you know be it uh, you know bharat dynamics uh, moving to your second question uh, you know specialty chemicals i happen can you just repeat that second question i i got part of it uh, sorry i missed part of it see uh, they, they 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 were asking on uh, the contra bets like for example large cap it and mid cap chemical and pharma what sure. kind of weights have you put in your portfolios is it like a is it like a contrarian bet if it is contrarian is it like eq weight or are you planning to go overweight Sure. So in large cap IT, we are definitely on the opposite side. Uh, you know, we like mid cap IT. You know, yeah. Rakesh is. Uh, you know, uh, Rakesh clearly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, let him take the question. But uh, you know, mm. we are definitely mid cap IT. Uh, we are. We were underweight IT. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was going to a page. We were underweight IT. I'm just showing you one of our. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, model portfolios. uh we were underweight it but you know soon the it position uh, uh we've been seeing month on month has been doing uh inching up and that's largely coming from er and d space where i think uh, uh, we are looking at we are looking at manufacturing er and d happens to be in it right so i think, uh, think sorry i'll just add to what you are what your uh, your point is there you know despite i, I know the sense last 2 3 days we've seen a huge move in it stocks especially the frontline it stocks uh you know which are more significantly the large cap ones but the kind of it stocks we have been playing is more on the mid cap segment because clearly we are seeing the earnings growth much stronger there you know so the likes of 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 cnt uh, or kpit uh, uh, technologies you know more in the errd space 
you know you saw the interest in the tata technologies uh, ipo you know we think structurally you know that particular segment of it services you know will do extremely well but even a company like you know for example persistent you know more on a lot of the, the digital outsourcing uh, theme you know or you know playing more and more on on the cloud uh, software outsourcing uh, theme we are just generally trying to identify where earnings you know are going to be significantly higher and you know that seems to fall more on the mid cap it space and uh, quite clearly you know in terms of the outlook the err and d part uh, you know definitely look strong so yes you know we we would like to maintain our our position or our weight there the only comment i will make on the on the large cap it space you know a lot of that over the last year you know clearly because of the the expectation of a slowdown in the us and you know an expectation that you know orders uh, would get impacted and you know all these issues about artificial intelligence etc uh, you know i believe our our underweight position helped us now does that mean you know going into 2024 you know if just because you know interest rates are going to be cut uh in the us and that expectation clearly is, is is there in the in the second half you know should we increase our position in the the large cap uh, it space you know i think at this point you know we i i would say at least we are not that uh, uh, confident that that should be the case clearly because the earnings outlook for the large cap it stocks you know are still relatively uh, uh you know not not that strong i mean you're talking about you know uh, uh low teens uh, at best or mid teens at best you know for companies like uh, lnt uh, mindtree for example but if you look at infosys or hcl tech or you know the the earnings outlook especially now where the multiples have reached uh, you know they they're pretty reasonable you know uh, for the kind of growth uh, that they're likely to show yes obviously you know depending on the on the flows you will see uh uh you know if that moves up you will see a lot of movement in in the large cap uh, it space but we still believe from an earnings perspective you know from from a further re-rating possibility uh you know mid cap is still a relatively better place than the large cap it space i don't know when you might might want to add something but that's you know at least from my perspective i i think that fairly no, solid smack on you know uh, very strongly believe uh, and i think manju our analyst has explained to us multiple times keep a horses blinder don't look at it as a sector her yeah. point is look at different businesses if today airlines is increasing their seating space and rakesh and ayapan are traveling so much uh, uh, the, you know the tourist industry is going crazy uh mm. you're seeing peak volumes come up uh, globally uh, indigo 2 is touching peak volumes you got to look at what's going to help them increase their uh, productivity and that's where it comes in uh, today if the world's going in ev you got to see what ev is using uh, mm. you know if it is using it so be it today mm. if we are so focused on defense what kind of companies are building uh, helping you both in software and hardware in defense and yeah. that's where the erd defense name comes so absolutely well put by rakesh you had a second question on chemicals and yeah uh, yeah uh, we're not clear on that uh, i'm sorry that? no i think uh, the question was on uh, more on the mid cap and uh, mid cap chemical and pharma as a sector uh, yeah. i think uh, what kind of weights would you want to put uh, are you overweight are you underweight are you neutral what's your take on that and uh, another question uh, probably uh, either of you can answer is uh it's again coming back onto the flows uh, assuming that uh the fis are going to come back uh do you foresee that there could be a the next leg of movement in the large cap so how would you position your portfolio going forward i mean whatever has happened till date is uh, is what has happened is already happened but going forward from a uh, 12 months to 24 months perspective if you were to build a portfolio would you have uh a tilt towards large cap how would it be in a multi cap kind of a situation so uh, so I'm, probably, i'm going to yeah. quickly take a stab on both and hand it over to rakesh for adding especially on the second question but quickly stab on both uh so you know if you see this chart again healthcare and agro we are overweight uh our analyst is extremely bullish the make in india story 
and there are extremely new innovative ideas which are getting listed which happen to be in healthcare but they're actually making india stories they are india's production growth or manufacturing growth story uh, in the cdmo space uh, both in specialty chemicals and health chemicals and that's why uh, we are there and they're largely in the mid and small cap space so happen largely whatever we seeing growth increase we seeing the increase in growth come in mid and small cap space as compared to growth come in the large cap space there are certain sockets in large cap uh, like you know the consumer names like uh, say a varun or a trend which are growing crazy but the erstwhile historic large cap names if the earnings growth is not there uh, is valuation the only reason to buy them and that's a question you know uh, worth pondering and everyone will have a different answer so i'm quickly going yeah. to your second question on that uh so for us because we are going bottom up after taking a call that you know the spaces where india would shine are make in india and capex they happen to be in small and mid cap uh they happen to be in small and mid cap and we are using the gar for growth at uh, you know reasonable price uh, logic to buy those mid and small cap names now if in these same themes some defense names or some banks which we like Uh, or some uh, both the consumer names we like uh, happen to be in large cap that's how we get our thing so we don't define ourselves that let's tilt ourselves to large cap mid cap small cap we tell ourselves let's tilt ourselves to stock ideas uh, go bottom up where do we see growth at reasonable price or where do we see growth at cheap prices let's jump them uh, we don't uh, try avoiding sectors uh, largely uh, when we are avoiding a sector uh that's when we'll by default look at the large cap and see whether you know it is stepping but technically you know we large cap mid cap small cap happens to be a function of what we get and today the way we are looking at it is you know we are 40 to 50% in large cap uh so the tilt is clearly in if it's one sector we are betting on it's large cap it's a little more than small and mid but it's disproportionately higher then a multi cap index uh, yeah. rakesh over to you i think i'll i'll just to add to what vinay is saying i think i think he hit the nail on the head you know i think just we seem to be fixated with this large mid and small you know i i i would look at it from another angle i mean there are a lot of companies even we are invested today you know they've already grown into large companies when i mean large companies they're having revenues anywhere between 500 million to a billion dollars you know maybe around 4000 to 7000 crores 8000 crores uh, already uh, you know and these companies have grown into market caps of you know now they've they've crossed uh, 5 billion dollars in market cap you know many of them have crossed 10 million dollars uh, uh, in market cap now obviously you know i can think of some names in the nifty you know where uh, you have market caps you know there's only three companies that are are above 100 billion dollars uh, in market cap but you've got a lot of companies in the you know 20 to 25 billion dollar market cap range but even there you know some of them are growing relatively well some of them are are growing okay you know in that sense does that mean that just because the valuations are are you know let's say uh, more palatable at these levels uh, uh, of the index you know should we be focused on those I, i don't think so you know i think the thing is we need to be focused on where we are seeing growth obviously where the valuations are quite reasonable uh, i would say but obviously the growth and the earnings we expect to come through and where clearly you know in sectors where you know these companies with a profit pool we expect you know to grow significantly over time so i think it's 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 a combination you know if there's a large company clearly it's a large cap i mean clearly a lot of the banks uh, you know would fall into that category of more typical large caps uh, you know where we are seeing uh, a decent growth and we would be prepared to invest in them uh, but you know overall i think it is uh, a case of you know today where are we a getting the growth valuations are reasonable you know and whether if they fall uh within a good uh, mid cap large cap or even uh, a, a smaller mid cap category you know i think as long as uh, we are comfortable with the company and the management and the growth you know that's how how we would be positioned uh that that's from our, our my my perspective and anyway, our perspective yeah yeah thanks uh, rakesh and vinay i think uh, one final question from uh, the team is uh, on the deployment strategy like for example uh if somebody were to actually put money today 
uh we are seeing every day the markets are at uh, euphoric levels uh they are all going up do you feel that the deployment has to be staggered uh, or uh, there is always another thought to it that okay you have done an asset allocation uh at the portfolio or the at the investor level so the investor has already taken a call to invest into equity so how mm -hmm. would you play it i mean it's a it's always a mixed uh, what to say a uh, a uh, Uh, emotion for a fund manager to deploy the funds so how would you how would you want to balance it out you, you know see this is something which we all have different styles so you know we have amish as a fund manager with us uh, rakesh obviously is uh, you know an expert in this so all three of us would be doing our own strategies to deploying it but think of it this way right there are some stocks we are convinced that this is close to the bottom there there is no need to have a debate that's where we will take it and these are absolute stock ideas not relative uh, but uh, you know there are some stocks which have moved up 50 to 100% and we like that idea still and that's where uh, uh, i i firmly believe you know we use uh, uh, staggered strategy but staggered at one time we used to do staggered over 6 months and using it sip now we do it staggered over 3 to 6 weeks and uh, you know buy the entire amount uh because uh, technically you know every month we, you wait if the correction doesn't happen and the volatility index the way, you know if you look at the vix index it's still in the 13 or 12 to 15 band or 12 mm -hmm. to 16 band it's not gone out of a level saying that you're worried that you know the markets will correct substantially fast for any reason so mm -hmm. uh earlier sip which was followed when we thought market was expensive uh, uh if, as far as i'm concerned you know uh, uh, the advice is technically let's buy it sooner than later but let's buy it not over one day let's buy it over a couple of days staggered so that the volatility intraday uh, goes away and typically we've seen in two weeks uh, you know we are deploying most of the funds so i would tend to agree there with uh, when i happen i think you know we have to at least appreciate you know that we are in a situation where markets you know are are moving quite rapidly there's tremendous interest uh, in india uh, you know so perhaps uh, uh, at one point in time we, we we may have taken you know a few months uh, uh, to to stagger a, a portfolio i think at least you know with the election around the corner uh you know today deploying you know i think uh, uh, the timeline has clearly shortened but it's where where you where we have the conviction you know uh, in in our earnings uh, outlook you know for that particular sector for that particular company i think you know that's the way we would have to to build it up combination of bottoms up and uh, you know also staggering it bearing in mind the 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 way the markets are moving i think that's the best approach right now right uh question on on a particular sector uh, vinay or rakesh can answer this this is basically on real estate sector uh, vinay um i think uh, what's your take on i mean obviously there is uh, there is a per capita increase people are growing richer so do you see the commercial market stroke residential market uh, what is your take on the real estate as a sector so uh that's one and number two is that i think there was a mention of uh, energy as a as a sector where you are not putting too much weights on so where do you see the growth of companies uh, in the sector coming from so two two questions sure so on the first one on real estate uh, mm. affordable housing is clearly the name of the game uh the indian government is very focused towards it uh and i think this is a consensus any government coming in that you know they want good housing for everyone uh you know you want to make rural india housing also very good so real estate sector is set to boom the question is how do you play that apple also the real estate pricing over a period of time have not inched up as much as it should have actually it had declined for a you know uh, declined to stagnated for a long period of time as compared to the savings rate of of every individual so affordability is a lot more today also the government has done a lot of regulations in uh, real estate which show you that the money which is de being deployed on the projects is actually being deployed on the projects 
uh, you know, earlier, quote unquote, people would be, you know, you will be hearing things of black and white components. Things have become such more automated that the real sector has become a lot more luxury for us to cover as an analyst or fund managers compared to what it was earlier. Having said that, the real estate companies have had a wonderful run. Uh, the consumption when real estate companies are being built come in from cement companies and that's something you know uh, we have invested in and uh, uh, you know our analyst Mukut has gone smack on right on both the demand part of it as well as how the EBITDA uh, you know would move up relatively both uh, based on volumes and then you know coal prices declining clinker prices declining which is now soon correcting and you know the prices have moved up but you know, this is something which we've got right. And here again, uh, we are looking a lot more at mid and small cap space because the valuations there are cheaper. Uh, going into the consumption part of what is being consumed in uh, real estate businesses, be it pipes, be it building material, be it tiles. So there are many ways for us to play it. Uh, very simple way of playing it is buying a home loan company. So, you know, we are all over. Uh, as far as real estate case is concerned, but as a direct real estate company exposure, that's where uh, we haven't taken a call on uh, currently uh, based on valuations uh, to pick up IAPA. So that's really our answer on real estate. Hmm. Uh, you, uh, I, Rakesh, would you want to add anything on real estate? Should we go to the second question? No, I think you're, 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 you're smack on there, uh, Vinay. I would uh, concur. We can move on. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Ayapan, your second question started with energy. Why we are underweight energy or where is earnings coming from? What was your question? Where is the, earnings, where is the growth likely to come from? In the energy space? In the energy space, yeah. Right. So, if you look at I think the question is coming largely because why had the earnings come? But let me just show you some numbers. Uh, the energy space had the highest growth in profitability of 150% in the last quarter. And even uh, FITD, they've had the highest growth. And that's because last year, uh, BBCL, HBCL, IOCL made losses. Uh, a marketing margin losses as a result of which, you know, the base compared to last year is not really real. So you got to look at two years profits coming into one year uh, for the companies. Incrementally, you know, in the energy space, when you're looking at it, uh, if you are saying that, you know, crude oil prices are going to be in the 70 to 80 dollar range because shale's increasing production, uh, you're playing with a refining margin of, you know, seven to eight dollars, which not new refiners coming up. So that may inch up and then you're playing the petrochemical cycle. So all these three, you know, at best give you a growth of 10 to 15 percent, not substantially more because volume growth is not there, right? And you're playing India emerging market to get a growth more than 10 to 15 percent uh, and not take a commodity risk. That's the reason why, though we think, you know, there will be growth in the energy sector, you know, which will be tepid. Uh, there'll be a lot more growth in the non-energy sector, which we want to capture. Up. Okay. Uh, with one last question before we conclude, uh, it's more on the I think it's more like a new new age sector, uh, which is uh, EV and AI. OK, so how is there some kind of a play in the Indian market? What is your thought on it and how are you playing it? So the entire ERD space for us uh, mm. have companies which are doing AI. A uh, lot of the companies are doing EV as well. Uh, case in point is, uh, you know, simply put uh, KPIT, you know, a stock which we've played historically, we've owned historically, uh, which touch wood, you know, uh, 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 Manjur analyst got really right because her point was uh, the IT spend is going to be substantial. And now we are hearing they are getting into even manufacturing uh, in the time to come. Uh, so there are plays, uh, the entire ERD space, I think, is giving the answer for EV and AI for us. Purely EV, uh, it is also the specialty chemical space where, you know, be it a Tatva Chintan, uh, you know, which is getting into hybrids and electrolysis where we are playing it through as well. Cool. Uh, I think uh, there are no more questions, uh, uh, Vinay and Rakesh. Maybe if you want to uh, wrap the seminar up uh, with your closing remarks, I think it will be good. Uh, over to both of you. So, you know, I think just to say that it's uh, it's been a pleasure 
for myself, Vinay, you know, the entire team uh, to host uh, this particular uh, webinar. And I hope it's uh, helped all of our uh, investors, uh, clients, you know, everybody to have a better understanding of our thoughts and our views uh, going into 2024. And I think, you know, it's going to be an eventful year and we are obviously quite excited uh, about that. So, uh, you know, once again, thanks to everyone. Vinay, any any closing remarks? Just side? just something which my compliance team has reminded me time and again. Uh, please look at our disclosure levels as well as our disclaimers. Uh, uh, when you are looking at our presentation in totality, uh, we would appreciate that a lot. And obviously, if there are any further questions, feel free to get back to any of us at JM Financials uh, PMS team. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vinay and Rakesh, and thanks uh, everyone who have logged into this uh, call. Uh, taking this opportunity to wish all of you a, a happy new year, and thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye bye.